Welcome to NAB Solution Series program titled Understanding Your Tenant, a law firm's perspective on its real estate needs. My name is Sandy Hudson and I will be your host. The Solution Series programs are available at no cost to NAOP members. These mini webinars run less than 30 minutes and our goal is to provide you with some quick tips and insights, all types of positive strategies and tactics to help you succeed in today's business environment. We encourage you to drive the content. Please send us an email to solutions at naop.org to let us know what topics and presenters you would like to hear from in future programs. Please advance to the next slide. Some topics require more in-depth discussion than we can cover in a solution series time frame. And for that, NAAP offers 90-minute webinars. These webinars are fully interactive and allow you to submit questions to the presenters during the program. The next full webinar takes place on Thursday, December 8th. This informative webinar will explain the various sources of financing in the market today, as well as discuss how current deals are being structured and priced. The cost of the webinar is $65 for NAOP members and $95 for non-members. To register for this webinar, just go online to naop.org slash webinars. Please advance to the next slide. And now let's get on with our program. With us today is Elizabeth Cooper, an International Director for Jones Lang LaSalle Brokerage Incorporated. Elizabeth co-chairs the company's law firm group and leads the Mid-Atlantic Strategic Transaction Services Group. Prior to joining Jones Lang LaSalle, Elizabeth practiced law for nearly 10 years at Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C. In addition to her real estate practice at Covington, she assisted the firm with respect to its real estate needs as one of the lawyers tapped to handle all real estate related matters. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks for being with us today. Good afternoon. I thought that we would talk today about how you all understand from a law firm's perspective what its real estate needs are today in the ever-changing economy and the basic uh, global economy in which we sit. So I thought I'd start with talking a little bit about the U.S. office market, uh, talk about the importance of the law firm market overall in that, then talk about concerns and considerations that law firms face today and looking at those implications for office space needs, talk about real estate-related cost control measures that firms are considering and implementing, give you some benchmarking metrics, and then talk about locational considerations. And with that, let's talk about the market. Um, latest market statistics that we have are for third quarter 2011. Third quarter 2011, if you look at it, you'll see that really many of the markets in the U.S. were bottoming out. And then, of course, the markets were like there's the energy sector or tech sector in San Francisco or in Washington, D.C., which usually rallies through, the, through governmental spending, recessions well, we were basically in a rising market. I can tell you that now, looking at the market, we are now fourth quarter 2011 and predicting for in the future, we aren't seeing anything rise much more, and some of these markets will stagnate. And until we think the election has occurred, I'm not so sure that we're going to see anything more than stagnation and maybe even some push the other way. So what's the importance of the law firm market overall? Law firms lease about 509 million square feet across 23 U.S. markets, and you'll see that we label the markets by tier cities, you know, how much, how much is leased, clearly the biggest cities being no great surprise, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Chicago. Uh, to Second tier cities, though, fair amount of law firms, and even there's some in third tier cities in Tampa, Orlando, and the like. But interestingly enough, about 19% of overall U.S. downtown office space is occupied by law firms. Therefore, you may have some interest in what they're thinking. So what are the concerns of law firms today? Well. Law firms right now are being driven by the demands of their clients. And what are their clients demanding? To change their billing structures. It's no longer all about hourly rates and how many hours you can bill. Really, it's about being creative and having different billing strategies, different ways in which law firms bill their clients. And those are pinching law firms and making them, therefore, concerned about controlling the cost side of things. Revenues are being 
held because their own corporations, clients are saying, I'm not paying your big bills anymore. Let's have set fees. Let's make sure we agree ahead what the litigation is going to cost. So that's actually making them more concerned about expense side. Also, there's a commoditization of legal services. There are now more routine matters being handled by not the the major AMLA 100 firms necessarily, but really by specialty firms. And the specialty firms can handle those more economically. They, these are the types of services that are employment law related, uh, immigration, divorce that really aren't needed by the big firms at, and aren't money makers. Uh, law firms therefore have shed those types of services, the, the major ones. Um, also, there's a heavy use of non-lawyers for staffing. So if they can get contract attorneys, and there have been many, many attorneys that have been unemployed, that they can use to handle certain matters, that's even better. And you'll see later when we talk about metrics that that has implications for space because those attorneys, while had been staffed within the law firm's offices, now are trying to be staffed outside those offices. Um, there's an uptick in M&A. I think we're going to see that continue. We're going to see a shrinking of the number of AMLA 200 firms. I believe that there will be more consolidation within that industry, and you'll see more of what I deal with day to day, which is when firms merge, what do we do with the excess space? We have two offices in one city. Um, that's going to continue. Uh, and so I think that the number of actual AMLA 200, AMLA 100 firms will shrink. Uh, key metrics for law firms are profits per partner. They look at everything on a real estate basis as far as cost per professional. How much does it cost me to house each attorney or professional for those who have patent attorneys or, or basically not lawyers but specialists within their organizations. Uh, technology, now that technology has really come into its own and finally firms have caught on, maybe I don't have to print every single piece of paper and electronic filings are in place and all the court systems, I think finally paper is going to start diminishing at firms. And then, again, they won't pay the high rents for just housing paper. Again, less space. Uh, communications and connectivity. Uh, with Basically, law firms are still very concerned about connecting their people. While people can work from home and video conferencing is used a great deal, they still want their people to see and touch one another, and they should. They need to do that for a cross building. They need to do that to keep the culture of the firm. So I don't think we're going to head towards what people talk about is, you know, firms working out the, out of their home, no need for office space. I think it's going to still be there's an office for people, but maybe, in fact, it's shared for those of who travel a lot or who those who do actually work out of their house part time. Moving to considerations for law firms today, so you've got revenues down, occupancy costs down, capital down. On the other side, biggest concerns are for efficiency of space, flexibility in not just their space but their lease, and branding. What does this say about me? How do I differentiate myself from the other through my office space? So now we talk about implications for office space. I think there's modest growth, if any. In fact, I think that most firms, um, when we talk to them, except in their major cities where they're looking to grow that office, they are looking to contract, and especially in secondary markets. Focuses on core cities, secondary markets, second tier NFL cities. You'll see some firms that opened offices close them. I think many of them will shrink them. If they were there for just a client, it's probably not needed anymore, and as the partner ages, the office will close. Um, I think demand for the next 18 to 24 months will be thin. You will not see a lot of activity from law firms unless they have a lease expiring or another driver, but many firms right now don't want to be spending money on real estate. Um, in, in selecting an office building, what's important to a firm? and what therefore should be important to you when you are developing office space. The ideal floor plate is column free. It's narrow. It's got more window line. No longer do they need any interior space to house paper. Secretarial ratios have changed greatly, so having secretaries all over the place no longer makes sense, and that'll change even more. They are, some of them um, are moving their back office operations to cheap, 
cities, cities where labor is not as expensive, where there's a good labor pool. And as we just saw, Pillsbury doing in Nashville and um, Warwick in West Virginia, it'll, it'll continue. Uh, I think that's one way that firms are trying to control costs and actually for redundancy reasons. Um, the other thing about the office building is that the floor plate really isn't ideal if it's more than 25,000 square feet, and that's because their people can't find one another. It is hard on a 40,000 square feet to find a partner at one end versus the other, and the partners don't travel from one end to the other. So when we talk about the firms wanting to collaborate, wanting to see people, they're looking for a small or narrower floor plate. The narrower floor plate also maximizes light. Firms are concerned about light space. They are actually do care about lead and will be building out to lead or at least taking measures to make sure that they are making the space light, bright, and energy efficient for the firm and for their people. Um, the other thing we do see is not just moving back office operations to other cities where it's cheaper, but to below grade space, space that may have some light for storage and support functions. Many firms that are in um, 100,000 square feet or so can actually move 20,000 square feet down to below grid space. That could be record storage. That could be um, IT. That could be even accounting, um, even some administrative functions. And that saves a great deal on cost. So we see a, a, a desire for below grid space with light. Um, the other thing that we see is because firms have moved to conference centers. Almost every large firm now has, most firms have a conference center, so they centralize where their clients go. If clients no longer travel through their offices for security reasons and confidentiality reasons. The conference centers have gotten to the stage where they're large enough that it requires buildings to have wider stairways and actually add more restrooms than typically to meet code. And we see this in a lot of cities. So in designing buildings, firms when they're looking especially at new product, are very concerned about what the, the building can stand. So can it stand the, the conference center they want to put in? Uh, what are firms looking at as far as space design? Well, they've shifted for, uh, to one or two standard office sizes. So either they've got one size office now, 150 to 180 square feet is typical, or two size offices from 120 to 150 for associates and counsel to 200 to 250 for partners. Everything's more standardized, so it's more flexible, so we don't have so many issues of churn. One size office gets them to, if they do have churn and people need to move, there's no cost, there's no moving walls, and that's ideal. Um, they've eliminated the centralized library and the reception redundancies. They have also reduced case rooms and war rooms. As I said, paper is finally being moved off site. So let's look at some benchmarking. What what was it in 2006 that firms were doing differently than they're doing today versus what they'll do in the future? And if you see across the screen, partner size offices were anywhere from 225 to 300 square feet in 2006. They were all different sizes, depending upon the geometry of the building and the age of the firm and the age of the partners and the type of practice it was. Today, almost every firm looks to try to standardize those office sizes. 225 is usually large enough with the right furniture for a partner. They're not looking to put conference tables in those offices for partners to have meetings within their office. Um, and in the future, what do we think it's going to be? Probably 150. And it'll be perimeter. And if they go towards models that they have in Europe, and especially in London, may even be interior. Uh, associate size offices, similarly, uh, 2006, 150 square feet to 180. Now pretty much standard at 150 or some 120, uh, depending upon the building geometry between those ranges. And I think in the future it'll stay at the same size as for partners. I think that is for flexibility reasons. But what you'll see is associates being moved to interior offices, um, summer associates for sure. Visiting offices will be interior. If they have interior space to use, firms are using it for associates, especially first and second year. And in New York, it's common to use it for, for interior offices for associates. Legal secretaries. I think that's been the biggest change in firms is that the ratio that used to be 1 to 1 and then was 1 to 3 in 2006 is now between 1 to 3 to 1 to 5 
and it's going to end up closer to 1 to 7. We have some firms now that are already telling me they're at 1 to 7. So it'll be 1 to 8. Um, that means that the interior where they had a lot of secretarial carols are vacant. And what do you do with that space? So many firms are looking to recapture that space. That's why I think they'll build out interior offices for attorneys if they need to. They'll use that for case rooms or war rooms. They'll try to turn it into space for paralegal offices and the like. Where I think paralegals, while they weren't interior offices in 2006 and still are today, will be ending up in these workstations because I think that they'll be available given the secretarial ratio changes. Also, with the secretarial ratio changes, you'll see firms build out what they call clusters of secretaries. So secretaries will be clustered in one area of the floor plate to handle the needs of many lawyers across the floor. And they'll even bring in a word processor uh, part-time, maybe full-time, to help with the, the overflow work. Staff attorneys, we didn't see them really in 2006. Uh, now they're really frequently housed in perimeter offices. and uh, I think staff attorneys are here to stay, but I think most in the future will work remotely. Amenity space used to be war rooms, litigation storage. In 2006, we began to see conference centers for large firms. Now pretty much everyone has a conference center, as I said. Flexible spaces are what people are looking for in litigation storage. In the future, I think that paper, as it decreases, there'll be fewer war rooms and storage. There'll be increased amenity areas, really areas where people can collaborate and people can get together, bring people together. Soft seating and conference rooms mixed into the conference centers to make them more useful for events and the like. And again, as I said, collaborative space, cafes, team rooms and the like. Library, while it was iconic and was central to the firm in the past, is no longer. It's been reduced in size by 50% or more. And many firms have just practice collections for the practices that need the books. In the future, it'll be decentralized uh, for the various practice groups. And if it's not there at all, it'll be basically a virtual library. A data center used to be located on site with supplemental HVAC. Um, then again, firms decided that maybe they ought to put that redundancy in a secondary location, and we saw that. I think in the future, they'll move to co-locate sites or hosting facilities. Um, why put their money in there when they can do it more cheaply, which I think they'll find a way. So what real estate then related cost controls do we see in the lease and in the deal structures? Right now, I think we have seen a real wave of restructuring of firms and right sizing. Firms have had too much space. They downsized. They tried to sublet those who couldn't. And it's not easy to get any recovery on a sublet of any significance. Try to restructure and will continue to do so. They, they're willing to give the landlord term but they've got to shed that excess space. Um, some firms have taken the tact of short-term renewals. Hey, I don't know where the economy is going. I don't know how to predict my growth anymore. I don't know where we're going to be in the law firm industry. And those firms are doing short-term renewals. There are still firms that relocate. Clearly, if their efficiency gains outweigh the cost, and they've got an office that's growing, and they may be in a building where they can't expand, which is the situation I was talking about just before I got on this call, I think you'll see people still relocate, but it's only if necessary. There is a cost of the relocation, and even with high tenant improvement allowances and the like, firms come out of pocket to do that, and they have to be careful where they put their capital these days. One thing you haven't seen in the past that you'll see more and more is firms asking for contraction and termination rights. It's not just expansion that they're concerned about. Now they're concerned about what happens if what happened in the last five years happens again and continues to happen. What do I have to really contract more? What if half my people work at home and don't even want to come in? So those options and termination rights, rights to get out of a lease, more like in government contracting, I think you'll see law firms ask for and law firms obtain. Always flexible assignment and sublet rights, more important than ever if you don't have other exit strategies. Firms focus on how flexible are my assignment and sublet rights? What happens if I merge? Do I have a right to do it without the landlord consent? Absolutely critical. And what happens if I just want to sublet to a third party? Do I have to go through this whole painful process of landlord consent? And how flexible can I get the landlord to be in the lease? 
We've also seen most favored nations clauses, i.e., clauses which say, if, in fact, Mr. Landlord, you sign a deal comparable size with another tenant in this building on a basis of overall net effective rents that are more favorable than what we obtained, you must then adjust our rents so that they are as favorable as the new tenant you've just brought in. Now, we see that in really depressed markets where we are able to obtain it, overbuilt, Miami being one of those that I can think of. Landlords can't stand these rights, but these are rights that um, may come into play again if we go into a second recession. The other thing that's um, a, a real estate matter that landlords haven't typically had to deal with, but firms are more and more concerned about, is the write-off of unamortized leasehold improvements at the end of the term if they want to relocate. So they may have been in the space 10 years but haven't fully amortized their leasehold improvements. It's a hit against the partner's income if they relocate. How can the landlord help me? Can the landlord actually give me an offset, a free rent or something so that my income will stay the same? And that's something that firms seem to be more concerned about today than they were in the past. Uh, lastly, firms are concerned about location. You want to know, I think, just like they want to know, where where should I be located? And I think the, the projects that we've seen be successful, lease up quickly, are ones that are, I call, live, work, play environments, 24-7 destinations, residential, retail, and office. Young people particularly, and firms are always concerned about attracting talent, want to be able to live near their office when they're young in their career, want to have restaurants and other amenities on site. So again, amenities, very important. The fitness center, key, jogging trails, bike racks, restaurants, not just deli style, but also white tablecloths in and around the building, the development, very important. Firms still care to be near other firms. Believe it or not, they want to see their um, fellow attorneys and friends at other firms and so they don't want to be an outlier, although some have done that and, and done that to save great expense. Uh, they want to be near their clients in the courts, but less so than it was in the past. Not so concerned anymore. Easy to file electronically. Clients don't really come to us as often. We find that it's really based on technology and the like. They can handle it in other ways. Still critical to be near public transportation and amenities, as I said. I think those locational considerations will continue in the future. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, um, Elizabeth Cooper, and my email and phone number are for you at the end of the presentation. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Elizabeth, thanks for a great presentation and for sharing your insight on how office-based needs of law firms will be changing over the next several years. Our next Solution Series program will be available on November 29th. Watch your email for NAOP source or corporate e-newsletter for the program link. Thank you for listening to our session and have a good day.